My name is Tony Irwin, and I'm going to uh, talk to you today about uh, uh, some work my team has done uh, with the Bluemix um, UI, um, which is the front end to IBM's um, cloud offering uh, with Cloud Foundry as the PaaS layer there. Um, talk about the, the, the uh, process we went through in migrating a monolithic application to microservices, uh, Node.js microservices on Cloud Foundry. Um, and during this talk, we'll talk about the origins of the Bluemix UI, um, some of the demons of the monolith, um, our original monolithic architecture, um, how microservices helped um, slay those demons, and then uh, um, sometimes you trade one sets of pro set of problems for another, so we have some new demons uh, to slay as well. Um, so as I sort of alluded to, the, the Bluemix UI um, serves as the front end to Bluemix. Um, it lets users uh, create, view, and manage uh, Cloud Foundry resources, um, but not just Cloud Foundry. We also have containers and virtual servers and, and other resource types um, coming around. So when we first started Bluemix, some of you may know, it was pretty Cloud Foundry focused. Now Cloud Foundry is just a part of our Bluemix offering. Um, it runs on top of the Bluemix PaaS layer, which is Cloud Foundry. Um, as I alluded to, it started as a monolithic app. It was a single page application. Um, so all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript um, was served. Yeah, it had to be loaded to the page at once, basically, um, in one HTML page. And this was all served um, by a single Java app, which was also deployed to Cloud Foundry. Um, this was a common stack um, in IBM not all that long ago where everyone was using um, uh, do the Dojo JavaScript framework for the UI piece and serving it with Java. Um, so that was very popular in IBM. Um, in recent years, uh, we've started moving to other uh, stacks. Um, and this is just sort of a uh, screen that shows that the Bluemix UI is pretty large. There's, you know, this is five or six different pages there for dashboard, catalog. Um, resource details like manager, Cloud Foundry apps, users billing, and there's a whole lot more. So it's a large um, application. And this was, this is sort of a diagram, or it is a diagram, not sort of a diagram, of the monolithic architecture that we started with. The, the top where it says Bluemix UI or client is basically the web browser, and the orange boxes there you know, roughly correspond to the pages I showed on the previous uh, slide. Um, but that's just to show, that's really just all the JavaScript logic is out on uh, the browser, essentially, in our single page app. And then on the back end, the Cloud Foundry side, um, we've got a single UI server, which is Java. Um, it was bound to a DB2 service um, for some of the data persistence we had to do. And, you know, basically that passed through then to a whole lot of back end APIs, you know, including Cloud Foundry. Uh, the Cloud Foundry Cloud Controller, um, UAA, et cetera. So the monolith had some problems, or this architecture had some problems. Um, we had performance issues, um, he the heavyweight. Dojo is a rather large library, and we also wrote a lot of JavaScript to do all the logic on the client. Um, so heavyweight JavaScript loaded to the browser um, can be slow. And also in a single page app, if you know, a number of you have probably worked on them, you're relying totally on Ajax calls back from the, the client. So that can also create um, some bottlenecks. Because really nothing is in your initial payload except for um, the, the code that loads your, your uh, front end. There's nothing about the data that you actually want to see. Um, another problem was it's very difficult to integrate code um, from other teams. So uh, as we'll talk more about <coughs> here in a bit, with, you know, there's probably 15, and the, the list is growing, other teams that want to plug in to our UI. And so we all look like kind of one big product. Um, with the stack we had, that was really not a practical. Um, you know, you have to tell people to write Dojo. We had fewer people and fewer groups that wanted to write Dojo, for one thing. Um, and it's just not that easy to integrate these sorts of plugins into a single page app. Um, you have to push the whole prod product just for small changes. 
So you know, I fix a null pointer exception, I have to redeploy um, the whole product um, as opposed to just being able to deploy a, a part of it. Um, poor SEO, search engine optimization. Um, because as I alluded to, there's not a whole lot of, of content in the one HTML page that was served. Um, there wasn't much that was crawlable uh, by Google uh, and other search engines. And <laughs> new hires wanted nothing to do with Dojo as we uh, brought on some new front end developers. Um, they're like, why are you guys using Dojo? There's better stuff for, or you know, if you've been in UI development, you know, there's always, you know, every six months there's a, there's a new uh, cool toy. Um, Dojo had a lot of good things about it, but it was also kind of viewed as, as legacy, you know, old, old IBM kind of stuff. So now we'll get a bit into the uh, microservices architecture that we uh, migrated to. Um, and I call this slide the weapons of microservices that we used to slay those demons from the previous um, page. Um, but it, the, the approach helped us to migrate to a more modern, lighter weight stack you know, based on Node.js and other tools um, without starting over. So we were able to um, keep, this was also in a live running product that people were using and we couldn't just suddenly throw away all the stuff we had um, during this re-architecture, but with the microservices, we were allowed to slowly break pieces of the monolith apart while still leaving the core of the monolithic app there. And I'll show a diagram of that here in a bit. Um, the goal is to break the monolith into smaller services um, to improve performance, because these services would be op optimized for speed and page size. Um, this architecture, we believe, would increase developer productivity. Um, you can push smaller changes. There's less chance of breaking the entire uh, product. Um, loosely coupled services um, can deploy at their own schedule. Um, teams can use um, stack of their choice as they, they plug in. And you don't have to wait on others, because you know, I, I lead the core, what we call the core team. And you know, I, I think we've got about 25 microservices. We have some of the core components like catalog and dashboard. Um, but we have a lot of other teams that you know, want to do custom things and they don't want to wait on. <laughs> My team doesn't have the resources, for example, to provide that and, and teams don't want to wait on us either. So this helps solve that problem. Um, the way we started serving pages led to improved SEO because we started using a little bit more server side templating so that it was more um, of the user data in the initial payload. Um, so there was more uh, crawlable content. And the way we did it, and I'll show a diagram of this as well, um, you know, when, you, when teams plug in or when microservices plug in, you want them all to appear to be part of the same product. Um, so we were able to help promote some UI consistency um, with some microservice composition. So this uh, slide um, basically shows our, our general uh, microservice pattern, um, kind of focusing on UI microservices. We also have microservices that just serve APIs as well. Um, but all of our microservices are written in Node.js. Um, they serve lightweight HTML, CSS, JavaScript, trying to go for the uh, simplest approach that works. So if we could use vanilla uh, JavaScript for a particular page, um, we did it. Um, we do have some teams using other um, frameworks, you know, including my team, like React, um, where it makes sense for some of our richer pages and stuff, but still a far smaller footprint than we had um, with our dojo. Um, we use server-side templating, um, Dust.js in particular, uh, to make as much data as possible. Now, of course, you don't want to spend a bunch of time on the server collecting data to include in the payload, but but some things that we have cache, like the username and picture and, and you know, a lot of the stuff in the header we can include. Um, so when the page comes up, you know, the header renders right away. Um, and uh, kind of the, that goes to the next point. Uh, if you look at this um, diagram, uh, there's a common header uh, microservice that was added. And all of our UI microservices call that to get the HTML for the top, top row. Uh, the stuff at the top, which I'll, I'll show a screenshot of that here um, shortly. 
Um, we introduced a shared um, session store. Um, it wasn't so, wasn't as required with our Java app because you just have an in-memory session. Um, but when you have uh, distributed apps, you know, want to share things like user tokens and things, um, we had to add um, Redis um, to the mix there. And then, of course, these UI microservices can call any of the other backend APIs or, or other um, API uh, microservices. Um, the, one, the one thing I always kind of gloss over in this picture is, is the proxy um, there at the top in the Cloud Foundry box. Um, the proxy is really what sort of holds the whole thing together. Because um, now instead of having a route, you know, say console bluemix.net that just goes to a Java app, we now have that route going to the proxy and based on the path of the URL, it routes to the right microservice. Um, so this, this shows what I was talking about with page composition. And you know, I mentioned the common header that, that microservices call. Um, so basically, you know, the green box is the, any microservice, let's say the catalog. Um, on the server side, it will invoke the common API and get the HTML for um, what we call the common header, and there's sort of a picture of it here. Um, and then that's combined with the server-side templating into one payload and sent to the browser. And so then all pages that use this approach you know, look like they're... Um, there's other things in common, too, that you access, like some common style sheets and things, too. So that, plus the header, um, really enables um, the product to look consistent. And here's a, uh, a picture of our first stage of the migration. Um, this was, you know, as of about December uh, 2015, um, we formally introduced the proxy layer um, that I alluded to. Um, we added three uh, microservices alongside of our, our Java monolith. Um, one was the common header. Um, we had a home uh, microservice just for the, the home page and uh, solutions, which was some marketing material which we no longer have in the, uh, the core product. But, um, so we, we started uh, trying to pick pieces that we thought would be the simplest to migrate, you know, kind of as a proof of, of concept. Um, we, we also introduced two additional um, Cloud Foundry services. Um, the, I alluded to the shared session. Um, I guess we actually used data cache for that back in this time frame. We're using Redis now. Data cache was an IBM product. Um, and a no SQL DB for some data storage. So these are just, these microservices are just Cloud Foundry apps uh, and bound to those services. Um, phase two, um, you know, basically I'm just showing uh, more boxes moved from the top uh, browser uh, side of the uh, product and down into the Cloud Foundry. Uh, at this point, you know, which is about a year after uh, the, the, slide, the previous slide, um, we were probably about 90% complete. We still had some account, uh, you know, user management and things um, that were not migrated yet to the new architecture. And then, you know, this is our end goal, um, which we're more or less at today. Um, except we do still have our Java server. We do want to port that. It's working fine for us. I think we do want to still port it to, to Node before we're done. Um, and we do still have a small amount of legacy uh, Dojo code. So, so it was a, you know, we had to balance um, new function over re-architecture. So, you know, over about two years, we were able to do uh, a pretty uh, complete migration of the original uh, product while, you know, adding some new function and things like that. Uh, th this slide I alluded to earlier, um, we have a bunch of other teams um, that want to uh, plug in. I, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, what I've been showing are really the core microservices, the core pieces of the architecture that, that my team owns. Um, but we have things like, you know, Watson, Internet of Things, um, our new Kubernetes service, OpenWhisk, um, that want to be uh, part of the console, um, but not necessarily deployed with all of the core microservices or owned by my core team. And this just kind of shows that the proxy, so we have proxy rules for like slash Watson, 
that will route to a uh, server owned by the Watson team that could be deploy deployed everywhere, anywhere. Um, we proxy through, they can use our common header and you know, look like all part of the same, same product. And I might do a, well, I guess I don't have the, uh, I was gonna do a demo, um, uh, switched uh, to a, a new uh, PC, thank you, just before, uh, before this. I don't think I'm gonna try to fire up the browser and log in and stuff, but um, what, what I really wanted to show is that you know, if, if, as you're clicking on different pieces of the UI, uh, you'll, you'll seamlessly go to stuff owned by other teams. Um, you'll just see the path and the URL change, the proxy you know, routes the, the request appropriately, and uh, it all kind of uh, blends together. Um, so there are a number of, of new challenges. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you, sometimes you trade one set of uh, problems for another. Um, I think you know, we're glad we did it, <laughs> but there were other things we had to worry about now. Um, there's more, uh, more moving parts, more complexity. Um, it makes your, your build pipeline and test automation and all those things you know, all the more important. I think we probably <laughs> underestimated that uh, when we started down this path. Um, collecting uh, federated status, monitoring the health of the system. Uh, something goes wrong at 2 a.m. Uh, you know, the console is not rendering, you know, which of our microservices is a problem, or, you know, and, and sometimes it's, you know, outside of our control, like the Cloud Foundry environment we've uh, been deployed to has problems. Um, so we needed a way to monitor those um, aspects of health and to kind of, you know, we're all responsible for reliability and, and HA and everything, but, uh, Sometimes, you know, just to get past a particular problem, um, you need to find the right team to actually get looking at, at the issue. Um, so we quickly developed some monitoring tools to help, you know, point um, uh, the problem at the right team. Now, sometimes it was my team too, but uh, not always. Uh, the granularity of microservices and, and memory allocation. Um, talked, the, the previous talk, Mentioned, you know, 512 megabyte uh, for, is good for a for Node.js app. Um, when we had the monolith, you know, we had three or four instances at at two gigabytes a piece for Java, and so that's about six gigabytes total. If you have, you know, about 27 microservices with, you know, three or four or five instances a piece, I think at one point we had about 95 total instances. They're all at 512. <laughs> megabyte or, or even a little bit higher in some cases, you, know, you end up with a system that's you know, taking 55, 60 uh, gigabytes now to deliver a lot of the same function. Um, not as big of a deal for our public offerings, but we also do deploy um, into uh, some customers, local and dedicated environments. And they're not, not necessarily happy about paying <laughs> uh, for a lot of memory uh, just to run the console. So that's uh, you know, a consideration. Um, we did have to solve some issues with seamless navigation uh, between our new microservice UIs and, do and our Dojo UI, our monolith, trying to make things look as close to the, to the same as we could, um, those sorts of things. Uh, Blue-green deployments, you know, one, one question, it's one thing to do a blue-green deployment of a single app, but if you have 25 apps, uh, how do you do that? Um, we ended up having an on-deck, basically, version and a production version of the apps. So, all the, so we had two versions of all the microservices deployed, and we would do a blue-green uh, swap on the proxy for each of those. And so basically you're sending, setting up a whole new, you're suddenly routing to a whole new set of microservices. We want to be more granular. With, with something we're still working on in our pipeline is to be uh, more granular than that and do blue-green swaps at the individual uh, microservice level. Um, this is a big problem is promoting uniformity and consistency um, while still giving teams uh, freedom. Um, so we have, uh, we have a large set of UI designers in IBM and there's different UI designers um, applied to the different teams. Um, they often have <laughs> differing views on how the UI should look and behave. Um, so you want to give people, <laughs> let their imaginations go and, and uh, 
you know, come up with, you know, innovative UIs, but then you run the risk of having, you know, half the UI looking and behaving one way and, you know, other pieces a totally different way. Um, so that's, you know, still an ongoing challenge uh, for us. Um, another point I threw in here, and I guess I've got another slide on it, too, to go in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, we did this work um, to be a microservice based within one uh, deployment of Cloud Foundry and, you know, a lot of, of resiliency and HA work as part of that. Um, but then how do you go and make that more globally um, available? And I'll just go ahead and go to the next, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I did want to uh, drill down into the importance of monitoring. Um, I alluded to that we kind of underestimated um, uh, how important monitoring was when we first deployed our first two or three microservices. So as we deployed more and more, this became all the more important. Um, you know, lots of things can go wrong when you have this many uh, components and, you know, root cause determination can be difficult. So uh, we did a lot of work to uh, start collecting metrics on every inbound and outbound request um, for every microservice uh, with response times and error codes and you know, as much detail as we could get. And we can look at those things in Grafana, uh, which there's a little screenshot here at the bottom. And in fact, I have a talk tomorrow that's gonna go even deeper into all this if, if you're interested. Um, we were very interested in memory usage, CPU usage, um, and uptime, uh, crashes um, for all of our microservices. Um, so, so now we, our monitoring is set up so if an app crashes, for example, um, we send an alert to the appropriate people. Um, general health of ourselves and our uh, dependencies. Um, for example, if we can't get to our Redis server, um, we can't share the token and, you know, people can't really authenticate and do what they need to do in the UI. Um, so that's part of the, the health we have to keep monitoring. And we also do work where we have uh, synthetic uh, page loads. So we uh, run site speed IO strips. Um, uh, regularly in the background, um, so we can always see how uh, certain pages are performing and from different parts of the world. Now back to the <laughs> global load balancing. Um, so we've got four, currently have four public regions of Bluemix, um, Dallas, London, Frankfurt, and Sydney, and we've got all these microservices uh, deployed in each one, and each one of those has its own uh, URL. You know, it's console.region.bluemix.net. Um, so a, as I mentioned, you know, we, we wanted to do some more HA work here because, you know, if one region goes down, um, you know, maybe there's a problem with Cloud Foundry, which could never happen, I suppose, right? Um, or there's a networking problem or, or some other thing. Uh, users going directly to a regional URL are going to say, well, this thing doesn't work. You know, they see errors and white pages and, and all this stuff. Um, so, what we're currently rolling out, we call Global Console. So basically, we're starting to distribute uh, the load over the microservice systems in all of our uh, regions. So we have one global, we'll have one global URL, which is actually live today, um, consolebluemix.net. Um, <clears throat> and there, we did have a region, concept of a region switcher even in the old model, but it would totally switch URLs to the deployment in the other region. Now it just really does a filter within um, the current. Uh, so wherever the UI is being served from, you're doing a filter within that. Uh, we're using Dyn uh, Geo Load Balancing so that uh, whichever of our regions is closest to you when you go to the browser is where you'll get the UI um, served from. Um, so if you're in New Zealand, you would probably get routed to our um, Sydney, Australia um, console. And the, the other thing that's, you know, I kind of alluded to monitoring and health checks and stuff. We've gotten our health check to the point now where, uh, you know, Dyn consults it in the different regions. If, if a region is uh, considered down uh, by our health check, then Dyn will stop routing there for a bit until it's healthy again. Um, so in this way, you know, hopefully the user never sees you know, what, what looks like a full outage. There may be, uh, you know, they may not be able to manage their Dallas CF resources at any time, 
at any given time, but they could still manage their uh, Kubernetes clusters and stuff because the UI, they still have a UI that works and is able to talk to the appropriate backend APIs you know, across the world. And that takes me uh, to the end. Any, I see you. I already have a question. Well, be, well, the jump in memory was because we had only had one app with two gigabytes in instance, and then we had suddenly had 25 apps with you know 512 megabytes in instance. And even if you just do the do the math, that's a lot more memory. Now we have looked at uh, you know some of our microservices were probably allocated more memory than they needed, and we've you know we've cut some of that stuff back over time. Um, you know, sometimes uh, if the, if the microservice isn't doing much. You know, 256 or even 128 uh, may work, um, but we were never able to cut it all the way down to uh, the uh, memory usage of one app. It's it's not so material to our public deployments. Um, more so when we d deploy onto a customer's hardware, and they're like, "Well, why do we have to pay extra for this?" But you know, I do get to see. Uh, you know, obviously, my team is not paying uh, uh, for the use of the, of the Cloud Foundry resources, um, but uh, I do get to see what we would be billed <laughs> if, uh, if we did have to pay, and it does add up. I mean, uh, so certainly if you're a, you know, not lucky enough to be able to work at IBM and deploy on IBM uh, resources, if you need to use 55 gigabytes uh, for your microservice system, there, there's going to be some cost involved there. I think no matter which Cloud Foundry <laughs> provider you use, you'd have to pay, pay more for that. So on your global load balancing, how did you keep the different regions in sync? Different versions? Or different regions in sync? You know, with the oh yeah, so, well that's a good question because we, uh, uh, we, we do try when we roll out a new, I mentioned we have an on deck and a, and a production set of microservices in each of our regions. We do typically upgrade them at the same, roughly the same time. So we'll usually upgrade like Sydney and then Frankfurt and then London and then Dallas. But there's certainly times there where they're not exactly the same version. Um, so I think it's, uh, uh, in general, we're, uh, it doesn't hurt us too bad yet because you know, you're, if you're getting your UI from Sydney and it's not exactly the same version as Dallas, at least the Sydney stuff is going to work with whatever APIs and, and such are there. Um, it may not quite have a new uh, function um, that we've deployed to Frankfurt, so there could be you know a half hour where you know a user being routed to Sydney won't see the same thing that they saw in Frankfurt exactly. Um, but uh, it hasn't been a huge issue for us yet. But if we do a do a major upgrade of a, of a, like our theming and stuff at some point, I th I th we'll probably have to think about that a little bit harder because you know, you, if you get routed to Sydney and you see you know, green and orange and whatever, and then maybe you fail over to Dallas and you see the old style, um, that might be a bit, bit jarring. Uh, also, we're in the process of doing something very similar. Okay. So what, what suggestions or tips would you give us based on your experience? Um, so we've had pretty good luck with, with Dyn um, for this. Um, we actually have a little bit of a weird situation because we're, um, we're using Akamai uh, for our CDN and uh, WAF DDoS and such. So we really have a combination of, of Akamai and Dyn, um, which is a little bit weird. <laughs> I, I would, I would, uh, we're actually looking to see if we can uh, move, <laughs> move one way. Or the other, so that it, so all the uh, configuration for this is housed in, in one place. Um, there's there's also issues that we're working through with with Dyn right now about you know when there is a failover, um, why did it happen? Because sometimes you know it could be our health check legitimately returned, oh uh, we're down because Redis is down. But sometimes requests don't even get to our health check. Um, you know if there's a, a networking problem or a firewall config problem. And it's not always t easy to tell from the Dyn alerts um, you know, why that was. Um, so we have to you know, start getting our networking guys involved to say, well, why can't, 
why weren't these requests getting through and, and things like that? I don't know if that, does that answer the question kind of? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were trying to move to a global, <laughs> global load balancing. I'm sorry. Oh, so, okay. So tips on, okay. And now I understand the question. So tips on moving from a mon monolith to, a, to microservices. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I think I've got a lot of those. Um, Tony, <laughs> probably not enough time, but. Uh, yeah, I wonder if we could let people go to lunch and anyone who's okay. still interested could come up to the front and talk to Tony. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Yep.